I'm calling to order the uh, meeting of the hearing board of the Ventura County Air Pollution Control District. Uh, the time is 5.32, and this is March 14th, 2011. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. Daniel Murphy? Here. Gary Gasparino? Here. Mike Stubblefield? Here. And Stephen Herlock? Here. Please note that we have a, a quorum tonight. Will all those giving testimony please rise to be sworn? Please raise your right hand. You and each of you do solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give in the matters now pending before this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truths. So help you God. I do. At this meeting, we'll be uh, hearing petition number 834, petition of Vintage Production, California, LLC, for a short variance from District Rule 29C, conditions on permits, violation of federal operating permit number 404, attachment 71.1N1, condition 1, and District Rule 71.1, crude oil production and separation, sections B.1 and C.1. Requirements for storage tanks and produced gas. This petition is continued from 2711, where it was item 4, and 22811, where it was also item 4. Will the representatives from the petitioners uh, please introduce yourselves? I'm Casey Shumate, Mechanical Integrity Coordinator for Vintage Production California, LLC. I'm Jim Lovins, Senior Environmental Advisor for Vintage Production Company, California, LLC. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you to, to summarize your, your petition and, and focus on the things that have changed since uh, the 2000, or since, since the uh, February 7th meeting. Uh, hearing board members, district staff, I think uh, some of the changes are uh, we have uh, done some more looking at our facilities and have uh, reduced our flaring uh, ability at our site. We have contacted the third parties. Uh, we still have uh, the, the same project schedule except just move back to the 28th as noted in the the, the new draft order uh, additional information uh, mr. Herlock you uh, submitted some questions I believe we've answered those uh, in your packet we can go I can go over those if you wish the, the additional is basically the same uh, smart pig project approximately 6.4 miles going from uh, what we would call our Sulphur Crest area down to the Santa Clara River Bridge at 12th Street. Uh, looking at roughly, uh, everything goes as, as planned, roughly 17 days. We're asking for 30 days to take into account minor repairs uh, that the pigging project might discover. Have you uh, received a copy of the, the draft order for the hearing? Yes, yes we have. Uh, would you like to, uh, if, if you have any concerns uh, with the material on that uh, draft order, would you like to raise those before we begin uh, board questioning? Agenda number eight. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and we've reviewed the revisions to the draft order. And uh, on page seven of nine, number eight, uh, the APCD is pr proposing a condition that Vintage pay excess emission fees for the estimated excess emissions resulting from the could, Termo Company. Could you tell, tell us again where you are uh, on I'm the on draft the, order? You might have a different. Oh, okay. I'm on the, I'm on the other one. Sorry. Excuse me. 
Merci. I think you're looking for page 13 of the draft okay. order. Okay. Page 13, conclusions in order. And it's number three, about midway through the page. That's ABCD's proposing that Vintage pay the excess emissions resulting from the Termo Company and Miranda Petroleum flaring their gas production during the variance period. Um, we're, we're not going to agree to that. That's not our gas, and we don't believe we should uh, be required to pay the excess emission fees for the flaring. Okay, that, that concern is noted, and, and we'll, we'll be discussing it, okay. I think, tonight with, with you and with the, with the representatives from the district. Um, also, b before we uh, begin questioning, there were some uh, open areas with respect to the financial aspects. Um, might be might be better to to ask you to, to try and either uh, fill in or make corrections um, mm -hmm. to those numbers if they're to be done. But you know, yeah, rather than to get them out through question and answer. Okay. Um, in, in particular, there's on page eight of the draft order, there's a, a blank. So we're going to refer to the tables? Well, if, if you're prepared to, to help us get through this area that, that uh, begins with dot, 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 uh, we could do that now or else we can work through with, uh, with questions. Okay. Estimated financial losses need to be determined? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we... I don't know if it's, is that in the draft order or is it in the other notes? It is right here. Okay. If we require to join all, and then six. There's a curtail, okay. and then there's the shutdown. Yeah. Are you in the basket? Number first. I, I, are you are you referring to the the discussion that we had about the valuation of gas? As and the relationship of oil and gas in, in, in reflected in BOE terms. I think we cleared that up with the district staff that we're going to calculate our economic loss on the value of the oil barrels that we don't produce and the value of the gas that we don't produce and sell. So, and there's a, there's a, a number in there for the, for the um, value of oil and the value of natural gas, and it's basically a market value. Okay, well, we can, maybe there'll be some questions on that. Okay. Uh, members of the board, uh, have any questions for the petitioner? Oh, let me start off then with the look on the, uh, you have a, uh, the uh, letter that the, that is sent by the, by the district to the board, uh, and it would be page six of nine. Do and there's the table five there on the page. I do. Page. Do you have the staff report? Yes, I do. Page six of nine? Yeah. Does table five accurately reflect the losses that you calculated that you would have? Yes, sir. It does. And if we, w if we would substitute that table in for the, uh, on page eight, that would be sufficient then? I think so. Okay. Uh, I, yes, after the, yes, dot, after dot, the dot, 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 yes, on Mr. page Murphy. eight. Pardon? Yes, Mr. The, Murphy. When that, that refers to the, the amount that they would lose by curtailing. Make sure that we understand that's not their loss uh, if, if we deny the permit. 
subject variance. Mr. Herlock, could I maybe clarify? Yeah, please, please do. Uh, you are, Mr. Herlock is correct that the uh, figure that's on Table 5 in our staff report reflects the losses that they would incur if they curtailed, still, still being allowed to flare some gas, but curtailing production. Um, at, um, in the draft order, uh, the very last line of page 10, uh, I had calculated if they had to curtail, completely shut down production, that their daily losses would be about $70,286. That's, that's the loss in revenue from all of their oil production and all of their gas production. The, and that, and those, that includes the 12000 Yes, it does. And, and those figures are based on the oil price of <coughs> close to $101 a barrel, which was around March 3rd. Who knows what it is these days? It's fluctuating do, do between you, 98 and 102. Pardon, I didn't hear that. The oil price is fluctuating between $98 a barrel and $102 a barrel <clears throat> currently. From what is contained in Table 5 and what is set forth on the short variance order on page 10, between those two, we have sufficient data in order to fill in the order, uh, the order uh, accurately. Yes, we do. Do you have further questions, Mr. Murphy? Yeah. Again, going uh, on uh, the district's report to the board uh, on page three of nine, table two. And this is just a slight little inconsequential thing, but I was just wondering. It shows uh, PM particulate material, I think that means, if I, am I right? Particulate uh, matter. Pardon? Matter. Particulate matter. 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 Uh, uh, 0.4 uh, pounds per hour and 0.2 uh, tons per 30 days. Previously, it was 0.5 and 0 0.0 or 0 0.17 respectively. So the pounds per hour has reduced, but the tons per 30 days has gone up. Is that just was there a mathematical error in one of the calculations? I, I think initially that there were some math errors in, in the first uh, calculation. Thank and and the point four and the point two is now correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. Had the uh, district uh, talked with uh, Vintage with respect to the. Uh, a payment of the excess emission, uh, emission fees of Thermo and Miranda, the Murata. We, we have just read the draft order and the district's letter to the board. Okay. So there, there was no uh, discussion then about who would monitor and measure in these third-party producers what they were producing and what they... To my knowledge, no. Okay. I have no further questions at this time. Other, other members of the board have questions? I, I think I, I may have a couple. Um, I'd like to understand uh, generally in the, in the background 
portion of the draft order. Um, and this, this has been in the previous uh, documentation as well. You talk about increasing flow through the, the gas line from a, a number of reasons. You've stopped burning some gas on site and, and you bring some shut wells back online and other things. How, um, it's not in here anywhere, but I, I remember a number like 300 pounds as, as kind of the, the pressure of your line now. I don't know if that's a, a correct memory or not, but about how much are you increasing it from what it has been historically to what you expect it might grow to? The operating, of, pre the operating pressure of the line? Either operating pressure or flow rate, whatever terms that you have. A the operating pressure hasn't increased. Um, the line is sufficient size to operate at the pressure that it's operating at now and handle um, some increased capacity, but we've increased the flow through the, the line of around 10 percent, I'd say, in the last two to three years. It's Volume, not pressure. And is that sort of the extent of what you're anticipating? Um, I really don't have a number as far as an anticipation in increasing gas. Okay. Could, on, on page four, it, um, the, the draft order says that uh, or attributes to you uh, this, that the third parties were notified subsequent to the February 7th hearing. Did you, did you, that it, did, can you confirm that that happened? It, it, says, it says the third party producers were initially notified of the shutdown on February 14th. Yes, someone from our company contacted the third parties and notified them that we were planning to uh, execute this project based on um, getting a variance uh, petition. I just wanted to get a confirmation yes. from you. That was sort of hearsay in, in, in here. And you've stated that you will be able to reduce, make the reductions that are summarized on page eight, about in the middle of the page of the draft order, from 2450,000 cubic feet to 1950. Yes, we can make those reductions. One of the conditions uh, it's actually a, it's actually a finding still I guess that you will, will record the daily volume of, of gas um, combusted by the the four flares you're talking about three or four flares. Do you have the metering to be able to do that? The metering will be in place, and also automatic igniters will be in place on all flares. Good. Do board members have questions of the district? Of the district. Uh, yes, Mr. Stubblefield. Okay, <clears throat> my first question for the district um, is regarding um, the petitioners. Um, the petitioner says that uh, it, it's not it's not going to be willing to pay the excess emission fees caused by flaring the gas of the two third party users, uh, Termo and Murata. Do I have that correct? Yes. Uh, what is the legal basis for directing the petitioner to do that? I, I felt uh, that your board does have the ability to impose um, measures to mitigate the emissions and um, felt that it was an appropriate um, uh, cost for them to pay uh, since uh, those excess emissions aren't being uh, paid for by anybody else. 
I don't know whether to ask the district this question or the petitioner, but do these, I assume these two smaller third-party producers pay a fee to run their produced, whatever they're uh, producing, gas slash oil, through your infrastructure? Yeah, we have a contractual agreement with those producers to transport their gas through our pipeline. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll come back to this. Mr. Murphy. For, for the district, does uh, uh, Termo or Murata have uh, permits for their particular uh, facilities? Yes, they do. Okay. And my understanding is, well, rather than saying what my understanding is, that the uh, they will not be, is it the district position that Termo and Murata will not be in violation of their permits because uh, for them this is an emergency situation? Right. This is something that we feel is beyond their reasonable control. Uh, it's, it's out of their control and uh, Therefore, they're, they shouldn't be held responsible for uh, payment of any excess emission fees. Um, Mr. Oriana, do you have anything to add? Uh, just to clarify, I think we're dealing here with excise, uh, excess fees under Rule 41D. Is that correct, Mr. Duvall? Yes. I, I made reference to Rule 41 in, as to the manner that they would be calculated. Okay. Well, just to, to read the provisions to the, to the board. They would only apply to an applicant for a variance. And they state, in the event that a variance is granted by the hearing board, except a variance from Rule 50, the applicant shall pay an excess emission fee based on the prorated tons per year and on the maximum pounds per hour of the air contaminant emissions discharged during the variance period, which are in excess of these rules. The fee shall be assessed at two times the applicable permit renewal fee in 42, the fee shall be paid within 60 days after the petitioner is notified of the amount due. My only point here is to point out it has to be an applicant for a variance who's charged a fee under that rule. And it does not specify whose uh, uh, excess emissions are being emitted, whether but, but it's the applicant or a third party. It's ambiguous with respect to that because the, the uh, typically you, in writing that, you would uh, think that the, what they are seeking the variance for is their excess emissions rather than third parties' excess emissions, and therefore I don't think the rule contemplates. Uh, I, um, I, I, I would put the argument in that the rule doesn't specifically contemplate uh, paying for uh, emissions of third parties that may result because of the decision made by third parties of how they were going to take care of their production of, uh, and, and their emission controls type of thing because there are, would it not be correct that the third parties could choose other ways of emission control other than using the, the pipelines of the uh, of vintage here, even though it might be more expensive or impractical, they do have that option. That's correct. They could choose to shut in their leases. And my sole point in bringing it up is to focus the hearing board on what's at issue, and the normal rule would be that it, any reasonable interpretation of that rule by whoever has to make that interpretation would apply. In the first instance, that would be the director of APCD. In the second, that would be yours. And in the third, it would be a court. Yeah. And, okay. and to, to expound upon that is the district has, has their interpretation as if they can charge, but that if this board sees it differently, this board would rule according to the majority of the decision of this board. That's within your discretion. Who would be set up to, did you have any thoughts about who would be monitoring the 
excess emissions, if any, of the these third parties? It, it was my intent that the district would uh, be working with both Marotta Petroleum and Termo to uh, have them uh, record their uh, gas that they flare at the beginning and uh, end of the um, flaring period. I have nothing further at this time. Mr. Stubblefield. Uh, <clears throat> I had a brief ex parte discussion with Chris Cody today about uh, the monitoring, the means by which the excess emissions are going to be monitored. So I just want to go on the record and ask the district, how are the um, emissions going to be monitored? Uh, and I'm, I'm almost asking this in a, a general context, not with respect to the integrity of the petitioner in any way, but I, I noticed that that is the – that data – is the basis upon which the excess emission fees are calculated. And it says that the petitioner will do it. Now, is this some kind of a foolproof device that's just on, that you can't turn on and off? Uh, uh, I'd, I'd have to yield to uh, finish. It's, I wouldn't describe it as a foolproof device, but gas measurement is accomplished through a fairly standard process. We calibrate our meters on a regular basis. Um, most of our metering is done um, across a, an orifice plate measuring a differential pressure. So there's a, a small pressure drop across an orifice plate. Um, typically, there's um, a, a method to bypass that for um, purposes of calibrating the meter, but when we're flaring, when we're required by our permit to, to use it to keep track of our flare volumes, and I'm not speaking to the, the accuracy of this permit, but in general, we have to monitor and, and measure our flare gas volumes. And so there's some kind of recording device that indicates that there's gas going through to the flare. It's either a strip chart or a round chart that uh, is a, a paper chart, or it may also have a backup um, to an electronic recording device that records <coughs> instantaneously the rate. And there's also positive displacement meters, little turbines that uh, that turn when the gas flows through. Those are the two main types of devices that we use to measure gas. So essentially, it's an honor system. Is it, would that be? Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. it, it, it's not um, it's not a custodial transfer meter where there's seals or anything like that in place. Right. It, you could characterize it as an honor system. I wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, Mr. Stubblefield, we've, we've had uh, considerable experience um, with operators recording <coughs> gas volumes um, with these various types of meters, um, and, and we do have the right to inspect the facilities at any time, reasonable time that uh, uh, we wish. Um, it was my intent to have our inspector out of the facility shortly after they do start flaring. Um, and a number of the, the uh, meters that I've seen, at least the recording type strip chart or the rotary meters, circular meters, um, you can see when it's taken offline. Um, it, it's somewhat apparent when it is taken offline. There's gap, either a gap in the data or it'll go down to zero. <coughs> but, but it is it okay. is an honor system. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Dubai. Can I have one more question? Yeah, I have one more question of the district. Um, the petitioner has indicated that uh, it's not it's not willing <laughs> phones off, <please. laughs> that it's not willing to uh, pay the excess emission fees that can be attributed to um, Termo and um, Marotta. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Is that a deal breaker for this board um, in terms of granting the Variance? I, I don't think it's a deal breaker. It's not a deal breaker for the district, but I just felt that it was, um, um, since the excess emissions from both Termo and Murata were, were resulting from Vintage's actions, I thought it might be appropriate to have them pay uh, a fee to 
you might say, mitigate those emissions. I, I, I really wasn't intending to require the fees pursuant to Rule 40, Rule 41. I, I put the reference into Rule 41 as a reference point for how it's calculated. What's the precedent? Because in the years I've been on the board, I've never seen this particular situation uh, arise. This, this is the first time that um, I've given, given it any consideration and, and put it into an order and, and made that recommendation. But this board could make up its own mind with respect to that particular I, part of I, this. I think so. It's my understanding that you, that you do have some latitude as far as mitigating emissions and so on. We could insist on it or let it go. Yes. Thank you. No more questions. One short question. Um, that Thermo and Murata also measure their excess emissions in the same way that uh, Vintage does? I, I believe that they do meter or have a way of determining their, uh, their gas that they're flaring. Other questions for the board? Yeah, patience is a virtue. Um, a lot's been discussed, and I had the old vintage um, and the paperwork going back to February the 7th, and I looked at that in detail and compared it with this, and I certainly had red pinned item number eight with respect to uh, the excess emissions. And I guess what I was going to ask, and I think it's, it's come out with respect to um, why the district did this, um, because my, my concern was is that it, it was confusing. I went um, on page two of nine, and if I go to page two of nine, um, it says, the staff report? yeah, the staff report, I'm sorry. It shows and it indicates clearly that uh, the production is actually going to be decreased. It goes from 2190,000 cubic feet of gas down to 1950. <clears throat> so that's one thing that is different than what I remember uh, we uh, heard uh, in, in, in February, on February the 7th. And then the other uh, item was on page five of the report, um, five of nine, and it was pretty clear it says that the district's policy on emergency flares is that an unpermitted flare of any size can be used for maintenance or emergency situations for up to 20, 24 hours. If flaring is required for more than 24 hours, the company should apply for emergency variance, and the hearing board will determine whether the company qualifies for an emergency variance. Um, I guess I've heard enough. I, I, I just wanted to ask a, a couple uh, questions that were in my mind, and that is, Prior to this evening, has the district communicated um, the revision, uh, in particular item number eight, uh, requiring that uh, Vintage would pay, pay the excess fees? Was there any discussion with them prior to this meeting? Uh, we had no verbal discussion with Vintage. Um, the, the draft order and our letter of March 11th were emailed to Mr. Levin's Friday morning, I think before noon. And so that was the only indication at that time. We, oh. we didn't have any discussions about it. Okay, and I believe there was a, a question posed by another hearing board member to Vintage uh, asking uh, the relationship between you and the third party uh, users of your system, uh, Termo and Murata, I guess is what it is. Yeah. And it, the answer, and this is what I would like for some clarification, was that um, you have uh, written in your contract, I, I guess the question would be, in your contract, do you have the mechanism uh, to pass on your, uh, if there is an excess emissions fee, to uh, either or, or both of those uh, users of your system? I can't say for certain that the contract addresses an issue like that. I don't. I don't think it does. But I, I can't say that for certain. Okay, and that was part of my reasoning uh, for asking the question that there was communication prior to this evening. So, let's see. I think the the last. Um, okay, that's that's all I have. Thank you.
I have a couple of questions of the, the district. On the draft order, page three, the first paragraph under background, um, it, uh, it talks about the, the pipeline. And we've, we've had, and I've raised the question, I'm going to come back and, and ask the, the petitioner again some of my questions, but we've had some questions about the authority for this, but the last sentence in, in the first paragraph under background is the first I've heard that this pipeline is part of any permit. I, um, it says this, the pipeline is, is a part of the sales gas system for federal operating permit number 404. Um, does that by, I, I don't know whether the default is the right word, but does that also then mean that that APCD has authority over that gas line? Um, actually, that, that statement I don't think is really an, an accurate statement. Um, we, we pretty much, the, the, the permit for the uh, Ojai oil field leases that we're talking about permit number four um, really encompasses the the equipment and operations that are on what you might say the footprint of those leases. Um, we we don't we don't extend our permit authority to the pipeline itself. Um, however, if, if the pipeline runs, um, if the pipeline runs across Vintage's property, and it has uh, some leaking valves or flanges, those leaks are subject to our rules and regulations. We we have some rules and regulations that apply to uh, maintenance of uh, oil field. Um, Components, as we call them, so we we would have jurisdiction over that. But um, I, I would feel that once that pipeline leaves their actual property, we would lose the jurisdiction, and, and it, you know, in most cases, it's going to be underground once it leaves the property. I, I imagine, um, and, and we would have no way of at that point determining fugitive emissions from the pipeline leaks from valves, flanges, um, and, and may have a hard time discerning whether it's Vintage's pipeline or the gas company's pipeline or somebody else's pipeline. If, if it's um, doubtful that the pipeline is actually uh, either explicitly or implicitly in the federal operating permit, do, do you think that we should strike that? I think so. Sense? The board. Any other board members have a problem with that? I wanted to, to um, ask the d district: um, Is The statements about Rule 71.1, and I, I reviewed it again just recently. Um, the, their uh, use of the sales gas line as their destruction or, or whatever the, the term is, the way to get rid of the, the gas means that they are in compliance with Rule 71.1. Is that correct? That's correct. When they when they put their produced gas and, and uh, vapor recovery, their the vapors they collect off their tanks into that pipeline and, and move it off of their property, that's compliance with Rule seventy one point one. Okay. So it's only when they start to flare it in unpermitted flares that the violation begins. That's that's correct. This is, this is a minor, I'll say, administrative point, but on page 8 in the second paragraph um, from the bottom, the, 
the uh, under the um, Department of Conservation, the, the uh, what used to be the Division of Oil and Gas is now the Division of Oil, Gas, and Geothermal Resources, and they use the, the term Dogger. Okay, we can make that yeah. correction. Is the district in in agreement or understanding of the of the financial numbers now that are in the draft? We'd, we still need to to take care of of the dot 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 at the top of page eight. Right, and I think um, I think uh, we're in concurrence with Vintage on on the calculation of the costs. Um, uh, and, and that's the way the way we presented it in our letter or staff report is the cost on dollars per barrel and dollars per thousand cubic feet. That's the way that we've always done it in the past with your board and elsewhere, and that's what we've always understood from the producers. And um, so I think we're in concurrence on those numbers. If, if we change that last sentence in the first paragraph on page eight. Uh, and just put a period after revenues. Does that work? And and strike off dot 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 uh, of dot 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 and strike your note. Uh, yes, Would we it, we could do that because I think elsewhere we were we refer to their um, cost their their revenue losses. If they do flare and their revenue losses, if they shut in the lease, so those I think those numbers are covered elsewhere. Okay. Um, with the uh, permission of the, of the board, I'd like to, to reopen the questioning of the, uh, the petitioner. Uh, Miss Miss Cody just pointed out we may not have the costs from flaring and curtailment of their operations, and we may want to add um, Table 5 from our staff report, <coughs> or, or at least the, uh, the total numbers. Well, that table isn't, isn't in the draft, is it? No, it's oh, not. Okay. So I, I think we may want to include the uh, at least the figures, the uh, the total cost um, on a daily basis and 30-day basis for the um, that would be total cost of twelve thousand seven hundred fifty-five dollars on a daily basis, and over a 30-day period that would be three hundred and eighty-two thousand six hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, you're talking about the the curtailment losses. I think that the the table five, which is the uh, well, table five, is the one you just referred to. That's that's um, yeah. And those are the losses that they would incur if they do get the variance. Well, the uh, under finding three, the the cost is summarized of the of uh, denying the, the the variance on page ten of the draft order. That's what I was looking for, and I and I, I confirm with the petitioner those on the page ten on the bottom. That paragraph is reasonably accurate as to your losses. Uh, lacking, yes, lacking yes, sir. That is reasonably accurate. Okay. I'd like to um, open up the so. A little further questioning of the petitioner uh, with respect to some of my concerns that I expressed in, in some emails. Um, and the, my concerns were 
were aroused initially when you indicated that you took over uh, operation of the pipeline from, I guess, from Termo some years ago. Um, I didn't really know the condition of it because there were no records, and I didn't want that to continue. Uh, and in, in the response, um, you indicated that that this is a Department of Transportation uh, authority over that pipeline, I guess because it goes under a, a county highway. Uh, is that true or because it transports gas? It's both. Okay. It's, it, oh, go ahead. I'll, uh, I'll answer your questions when you get to them. The, the, uh, you've indicated that, that the, the, uh, the data from your maintenance operation, your inspection records and CDs or whatever, whatever comes out of your smart pig measurements will be uh, archived at Vintage and would be auditable by DOT. Is that correct? That's correct. W will DOT get a notification that that this has happened and that those data are there? No, we won't notify them that we've done this inspection. Oh, that doesn't do much good to have them there to audit if they're they're unaware of that. Uh, what well, they audit us regularly, and when they when we're audited, they review all our records. Okay. Um, did, why? Didn't you have records available when, on the pipeline when you took it over from Termo? I mean, they, as I understand it, Termo still owns it, but you're effectively responsible for everything. The situation that uh, Vintage Production California entered into when we, um, we purchased this pipeline from a legacy operator. The legacy operator entered into the lease with the Termo company in 2002. We bought the pipeline and along with some other properties in 2006. So we did not enter into this lease. Our company didn't enter into it. We assumed it. Um, the records that we have involving the construction of the pipeline in 1981 um, are fairly extensive. Um, we, we know quite a lot about the, the line as it was installed. And um, since the line that was installed, normal maintenance has not consisted of exposing the line proactively. We witness exposures of the line when a third party uh, turns in what's called a dig alert. There's a one call system in the state of California that if someone's going to dig in a utility area, they call into a certain number and our employees respond to that job site to witness the excavation. We've seen the pipe um, several times during the course of excavations. There's one area where the pipeline is above ground that's uh, suspended underneath uh, a bridge, and we have done some external inspections on the line from there. So I think we were, um, we were inaccurate in characterizing our lack of knowledge about the line in our first appearance before the board. Okay. The, the uh, records that you keep that, that the DOT um, can and apparently does audit, how long do you keep those? for the life of the pipeline. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think my, my concerns relative to the, the, the pipeline history have been pretty well put to rest by these responses. Um, does the district have any questions of the petitioner? Uh, no, we don't have any questions at this time. Does the... Any members of the board have further questions of either the petitioner or the district? Uh, yes, I have one question. Uh, with respect to um, if, if the board approves uh, the item 8 that was added um, to this variance, um, does the district, have you, have you calculated or have you come up with a number of what might be uh, the excess fee? I have. Um, the, uh, from our staff report, you've seen that um, the third-party producer uh, gas that they would flare has kind of a wide range of, of from 570,000 cubic feet a day up to 1,312,000 cubic feet a day. Under the, um, the lowest um, flaring rate, uh, I calculated 
an approximate excess emission fee of about eleven $1 hundred dollars, um, and and that's assuming a full thirty days of uh, flaring, and then under the uh, the higher flaring rate, I calculated um, uh, approximately twenty four hundred dollars, and again that that assumes um, the full thirty days of flaring from both of the third party. Users, yes. Correct? Okay. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. No further questions, no further questions uh, of the, the petitioner or the district. Any members of the public uh, wish to comment on this matter? Mr. Chair, point of order. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Vintage does not think that we should be charged the excess emission fees for third parties. Uh, this will be setting a precedent. And though the APCD does think the board does have the ability to do that, uh, it is my feeling that <clears throat> based on looking at rule, I believe it was 42, that uh, essentially the hearing board would be making a rule change uh, by clarifying that statement about excess emissions. And uh, most rule changes should go through the normal public review process, go to the uh, board of the APCD, the, the community board, and then uh, voted on by that board. Okay. I, I, I Note that I, I think our the, the board's council has has indicated that the the rule I think it was 41 is 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 ambiguous but does it does include the possibility of the, the third party emissions being included in that they they're not uh, specifically just the petitioner's emissions did, did I get that interpretation correct Mr. Oriana? This, of course, is a new issue to me, too, that came up, so I haven't researched it. But absent a declaration somewhere in the rules from the district's board itself or an interpretation that's come down from its board or from a court, it becomes in the discretion of the hearing of the, the officer of APCD to tell you their interpretation. That becomes within your discretion as to whether you accept that interpretation or not. And you can either accept it or reject it. You can uh, put the condition in or, or remove it. Uh, the petitioner is obviously free to not accept the condition and would not get the variance if you mandated that condition, where they can accept the condition. Thank you. Yeah, or they can accept the condition under protest and take that condition to court. If there are no further questions. Uh, I'm going to close the hearing and, uh, and we'll have some board discussion. Uh, Mr. Stubblefield. I'm comfortable that the petitioner uh, uh, has done. So I close the hearing and. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. The, the, the hearing is. I, okay. I thought we were closed. Yeah. Okay. And the hearing is closed and now we're open for board discussion. I'm comfortable that the petitioner has done everything that we asked it to do at the last time the petitioner was before the board, but I'm not comfortable with the petitioner's refusal to pay the excess emission fees. It seems to me that there's one, there's one pipeline, there's more than one uh, party using it, but the petitioner is the one that's responsible for it. The petitioner bought it and owns it. And, uh, I think it's the duty. It's the duty of the county and the APCD to. I, I fully support the district's interpretation in this case that excess emission fees have got to be paid. So uh, I don't understand why we would make an exception in this case. Now, I certainly could understand why the petitioner might turn around and tell um, Marada and Termo that it's that they have to pay it, and, and since they're kind of like the landlord and they get to set the rates, uh, um, there are means by which they can get their money back. Uh, but were it not for the fact that they're closing the infrastructure for up to 30 days, 
there wouldn't be any excess emissions. That's the reason that they're going to flare, and these two third-party providers are going to flare. So um, my f speaking for myself, I think that that's fair. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, it doesn't seem like that onerous a burden. Um, and I, if they don't pay it, nobody will. Uh, so I don't think that we really could make an exception, even though it's the first time that I know of this has ever happened. Uh, it probably won't be the last because uh, there are other firms that do share infrastructure, but usually somebody owns it. And in this case, that would be vintage. So my feeling is it stays in and it, and it is mandatory. Mr. Murphy. Okay, I, I'm going to... Uh, I, that was well articulated, and I have a different opinion, which I'll uh, articulate my rationale for. And two points I really want to address. One is when you have, in my experience, when you have a violation of law or a penalty, it is a burden upon the government to set forth with clarity what the law is. And if there's any ambiguity, then that inures to the benefit of the person being charged type of thing. Here we have a rule which is ad admittedly ambiguous, meaning, in my estimation, that if the district, if the district does want to penalize people for any excess emission that may result from third-party actions as a result uh, or third-party emissions as a result of an applicant. They need to set that forth in, in specifically in their rule. And here's the reason for that, because if that was set forth specifically in the rules, then vintage when making a contract with third parties would take that into consideration and would then probably in their contract, knowing that rule, would put that burden in their contract on those third party emissions. There'd be a pass through of that. The statement right now that vintage can go against uh, Termo and uh, uh, Murata is, I think, incorrect unless there would be something in their contract they already have that allows them to do that. They can't just because of the relationship do it. It has to be a contractual obligation that those two third parties would have to vintage before vintage could go to them and collect on that. So those are the two reasons that I think it would be uh, inadvisable uh, to put that condition in there upon the, upon vintage. Yes, um, that that was my thought process from from the get go when I read uh, item number eight, and that was the reason for asking the question whether or not you knew uh, within your contract with Termo and uh, Murata that you could actually go back and pass those excess fees. Your statement was you didn't think so, but you, you certainly don't know 100 percent, which is then the reason why I asked whether the district had informed you prior to this evening, which would have given you the opportunity then to have a discussion with uh, your management and then determine whether or not that's um, something that you could do or you could not do. So for some of the reasons Mr. Murphy uh, so identified or some of the thoughts that have gone through my mind. But I think, um, I don't know about setting precedent. Uh, I'm just concerned that uh, maybe um, we probably should have done a little bit more homework in communicating with uh, the petitioner uh, fully on this. Certainly uh, we had to do more homework after what was presented on February the 7th. So uh, I think most of my questions have been answered. Uh, the only other thing is uh, in terms of what your uh, losses would be based upon uh, the discharge and the, and 
and the curtailment that has been identified, uh, that was the reason for asking the question on the dollar amount. Um, looking proportionally, certainly $1,100 is not um, something that I would think would be uh, uh, prohibitive. Okay, um, but then some of the questions that Mr. Murphy raised also are uh, part of uh, my thought process. So I just wanted to get that on the record. Thank you. My, I'm seeing both both sides of this. Uh, you know, I would if, if the board were to uh, to impose this uh, this additional cost, I would certainly want to make sure that it was applied to the lowest possible number, that is the lowest historical number for the, the third party that's not going to uh, reduce and, and for 30 percent of, of termos, and that would be the up, upper limit. But on the other hand, rather than, than us uh, making this interpretation of the rule, which it, it doesn't appear to be there, uh, it's, it's possible, but I don't think it's there. Uh, I'd, I'd rather see the district change the rules that, that allow these smaller flares to emit with no excess emission fees. Uh, and then that's, that's why they're, as Mr. Stubblefield said, no, nobody's going to pay for them because they're under a million BTUs per day, I think it is. And, and that's, I'd, I'd prefer to see that rule change than for us to interpret a rule. So I. I, I come down, I think, on the side of, of uh, not uh, not imposing this additional cost, and, and partly in light of of vintages having in the past. Uh, what five weeks um, found uh, a way to to reduce their own gas emission by a significant amount and. And their losses for that curtailment is, is significantly higher than the the additional eleven $1 hundred dollars, as uh, Mr. Gasparino just said. So I, I think I come down on the side of, of uh, not um, not enforcing that item, but but striking it. I'd like to uh, move that um, we grant the short variance uh, with the exclusion of item three on page 13, which states, Vintage shall pay excess emission fees according to ABCD Rule 41 for the estimated excess emissions resulting from the Termo Company and Murata Petroleum flaring their gas production during the variance period. Uh, there's a motion. Do I have a second? Uh, there were some other changes that we've noted in the dialogue and with those that I think have been noted as we've gone through and understand said by both sides and with with uh, if I would add that to the motion I would second them. I really don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Could you clarify that for me please? Well we, we had talked about we had talked about inserting with the dot dot dot, the oh that yes, there. certainly with all of those things, yes, to make the make the uh, variance, uh, the short draft variance um, uh, in total. That's that's correct. I, I agree. I think we have a motion and a second. Will the clerk please call? I have, I have another point I want to make. It's actually a quick. May I ask the district a question? Um, I, we have a motion and a, and a second. I think we need to vote on it. Well, could one of you tell me when the district told the petitioner about this number three? Uh, it's a day? That was this evening, yes. yes. And that's the reason I asked the question. Prior to this evening, they were not aware of that. Prior to having received the, yeah. the, the draft, I mean the, the staff report, which was mailed Friday. What if we granted a continuance and had the petitioner work this out with the two third-party producers um, and talk about it? And in the meantime, have the district um, clarify uh, the rule as well and maybe add another paragraph to cover this kind of a situation. I, I think I would uh, ask the clerk to call the Call, call the roll on the, the motion in the second. 
Board Member Stubblefield? No. Board Member Murphy? Yes. Board Member Herlock? Yes. Board Member Gasparino? Aye. The, the motion is carried. Your petition is, your variance is granted. Mr. Chairman, board members, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Before we close this meeting, are there any um, announcements by the, uh, the district? Anything upcoming? We, we have no hearings uh, scheduled. And um, just a reminder that the conflict of interest reports are due by April 1st. And I think the clerk of the board, within the last couple of weeks, emailed you all a link and some instructions. Okay. Does it, any board members have any comments or questions? Yeah, I do. I'd like to make a comment to the district. I would strongly urge the district to look at that rule and uh, consider adopting it. Because I think it's going to be a That, that's correct. Uh, I can understand them being irate about it, but at the same time, it just seems uh, unfair to me to allow them to get away with not paying for those excess emission fees. I understand they're coming from these third party producers, but they're coming through the lines that they own, that they're responsible for maintaining and servicing and repairing, and uh, that they've made a decision to do so on at this time. So it's, it's certainly not the fault of these two third party producers, in my view. Yeah. Your comments noted. I, I would again suggest that it's just parting off the record uh, type of thing, but I, I would, this is something that the uh, district board should think about changing their rules to make it clear so people would know that that would be a thing that happens. On, you know, on the other side of that, uh, Mike, the, the, um, we would be imposing a uh, a fee on on vintage. It's true that it's it's a result of their action, but it would be imposing a fee on them for uh, flares that, according to the, the district rules, don't require permitting and, and don't require to pay fees because they're under uh, you know no, no well yeah. that they're under under the limit. Um, even taken together, if they're reduced, as they said. I've, uh, I, I would like to just ask um, the district to really think about how they want to proceed, uh, not necessarily modifying Rule 41, but maybe there's an internal process that says any petitioner or any permit that is granted where there are uh, third-party users that, you know, maybe that permit is granted with a clear understanding that if a variance has to come before the board that there is a process that that petitioner needs to be aware of, and that is that the third-party users might then, uh, not necessarily a third-party users, but the petitioner might. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. <laughs> I have a comment on a different, different subject. Um, it, it's just recently that, that we've kind of changed the, the protocol at these meetings so that the, the petitioner stands down there rather than at the table over there. I uh, wondered how, how the other board members feel about that and, and even how it, how it came to be. Up until how about two or... How did it come to be? No idea. We, 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 we normally, 
advise the petitioners to go sit over there, but I think what happened was maybe Vintage just got up, and I'm pretty sure Vintage has been here before and sat over on the other side, but they just got up and stood. So. You, didn't, you didn't impose that, did you, Gary? No, no, I was here before, and I think actually sitting here with, uh, with materials and anything else they might have, it really provides an advantage and helps them. Uh, certainly, if some of them actually bring laptops with information to answer questions, so I'd like to see them at least continue uh, sitting off to the side here. My only you know, downside, and it's partly because I'm altitude disadvantaged, <laughs> is that I can't see them over some of these monitors, which don't move. Yeah. Well, we, we need to have collapsible monitors. Yeah, they're they're uh, the, theft proof. The, uh, the additional reason is just. I think is one of perception that we do in these proceedings. We do have two sides, the district and the applicant that are presenting to the board. And I think there needs to be a perception that those sides are equal side, equal sides, and we need to treat them equally. And when we have one standing here and the other with their set portion over there, it kind of looks like it's us against, us against them, and I think if it's that way, there may be a little bit different perception. Okay, I, I think in future I'll ask the petitioners to sit over there. Okay. Okay. No further um, comments. Excuse me, I oh. have a question. I would like to have some clarification again about communication because I have people contact me, and it's like at one point. A question came through, and I thought, oh, that's a good question. Everybody should be aware of the question, passed it along, and like, oops, that's a violation of the Brown Act. Can't do that. So then another time somebody asked a question, and so this time we passed it along to the company, and they were able to address it, and then it was brought up to the board. But then some people feel like they can't ask questions, others do, and it's like, it'd be nice to have some guidelines. I mean, I don't, I mean, I want to do what's right, but I want the board members to feel that they have the opportunity to ask a question or express a concern, maybe if they should go to you or, you know, I just would like some clarification on that. Isn't it only a Brown Act violation if three of the board members have a discussion outside of if you have, but you can have serial communications that one, 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 and all of a sudden you're in the Brown Act violation. So it's it's tricky. What my suggestion would be, and Robert, you're the one to make the determination on this. But my suggestion would be when we have questions that we go through our attorney, who then our attorney then can. Uh, determine whether he wants to communicate anything with the district or not. Uh, yeah, I, when, uh, Robert, when you, um, you know, responded to my uh, email, which grew to be more than, than just administrative changes, that, that it was an ex-party communication, that's, you know, in my years on the board, that's the first time that that's come up that I can recall, and I, maybe it's a little more substance than other back and forth with, with Chris, but I think uh, other ones have been effectively, if, if that one was ex parte, other communications have been as well. So I think we, we do need some guidance, uh, and maybe, maybe uh, Dan's suggestion is the right way to go. Uh, yes, yeah, I guess my only question is um, trying to provide and pass everything through an attorney I may be asking, or I may have a question that's a, related to a technical issue, so I, I would just ask that you guys really think about how best to do this. I, I know early on, coming onto this board, I called and asked questions of either Chris or Keith, and it wasn't long before I was told, mm-mm, you can't answer these, and um, I stopped asking questions. Um, and there were a few other things I did that I found out uh, you're not supposed to do, like doing research on your own, et cetera. Uh, but that's just the engineer. So um, I, I just suggest, you know, I, I don't want to have to necessarily be in a position where if I've got something very simple, I've got to go to uh, counsel. Um, so that's all. My, that's my feeling. I can address these whenever you're done. They're all different. There are different rules, and they're different. You're raising different scenarios, actually.
I know when I go to a, uh, say, a coastal commission hearing, each of the 12 commissioners, uh, the uh, clerk says, does anybody have any ex parte discussions they'd like to disclose? And they just go right down the line and they say, well, I have one with state senator so-and-so or senator and so-and-so or a businessman or a lobbyist or whatever. And they just get that out there right away. And it becomes part of the record. So Chair, if you'd like, like me to address them all? I can, I can do this fairly succinctly. Yeah. Have you got one more? Yeah, one, one more, and you may may be addressing this also. But one thing to remember, and one reason why it's a problem, is the district is a party in front of us. They and whereas council is on our, he's ours, he's on our side. He's not with the district. District has their own council. So we, it's kind of like if we'd make ex, we would see it more clearly. I think if we started making ex parte communications with an applicant, that that would be wrong to have them explain stuff to us one on one. But it's the same thing is uh, if we would, when we ask things of the district. I believe I believe our council is really a referee. Uh, and supports the board, but unless well, I misunderstand. Let, let, me, let me clarify all these, I, okay. the, these points. Starting with the Brown Act. The Brown Act issue is when something is not on the agenda at all, where you're getting something decided like how to proceed, and that's what it came up, I think, with the extra conditions we have in the district rules on granting variances, where there was a discussion started that could have resulted in a decision or influenced the decision the hearing board would make that had nothing to do with any pending application. The Brown Act violation was that's a serial meeting and it has to be on the agenda. With the vintage situation and the general situation you're talking about, it's a due process fair hearing issue. It's is everybody informed of what's informing you as to your decision. And this goes from everything from the emails to independent research to making a phone call. As, uh, as Member Murphy pointed out, it would be just as bad to have you calling up vintage executives and asking them information, taking that into your decision making, even if not communicated to anyone else, as it would be for you to do that with the district independently. Therefore, any communications have to be disclosed. Postal Act and the Coastal Commission have a separate rule on their ex parties where they have to do that. It's in their rules. You don't have such a rule. We have land use rules that are applied to the Planning Commission and the Board. They have to make disclosures. This recently came up with the Simi Landville case, and they actually had tours out there. And all of that was done under strict rules because of both the Brown Act and the fair hearing requirements of the Due Process Clause. You can do independent research, but you have to completely put that on the record if you do it. That's why the advice and the normal rule for the Board and the County, which you're not part of, is don't do that. Don't even go there because it's so difficult to fully reveal all that ex party research. Ex party contacts is something differently. Different. If you need to do that, if you don't understand something in the staff report, it's fine to ask. It's better to ask through me. But if you need to ask, what all I ask is once you've asked, once you've pointed something else other than a nit or a typographical error to the district board, that email or whatever communication has to be disclosed. Either at the beginning of the hearing you'd say, on such and such a day I called Mr. Duvall and asked him what this term meant, like the pigs or something in the report. I didn't understand what that meant, and he told me where I could get a definition of that. Some things you need that aren't in the staff reports that are just terms of art, you may need to look up. It's a matter of disclosing that so that everybody has the same understanding of what a smart pig is, not just your understanding and other people's. So it can be a simple issue like that. The more complicated ones are where you're doing research or, or making evaluations that will influence your decision of which someone else is not aware. Either party or both parties aren't aware. That is discouraged, but it's not illegal. Uh, it's illegal to make a decision without disclosing that. So the Brown Act violation is very different. That's something where there's communications going on and the hearing board, which is not your board, it's not the district board, and talking now to the district, is, is being asked to formulate an idea or a rule or a way of, of proceeding that hasn't been put on any agenda. So there's been no public input, no, no chance for any applicants who may not be even before the board at that time to, to take part in the discussion. But once you have an open applicant and hearing going, it's a matter of the due process and making sure everybody has all the information available. Were you, were you saying then that the communication should 
first come through you? That's the safest route, okay. and I'll be, be you know, white, your willing to quickly answers. respond and saying <laughs> there's no problem or there is a problem with, with uh, sending this on. Once you've sent it to the district, I look at it and I say, if I were the other party, would, would I have a right to this? And if the answer is yes, then I advise you or with Commissioner, with Member Hurlock, I advised him directly. This should be, you know, sent to all, both sides. I, I took the, the approach of sending my email, uh, copying you on my email to Chris. And that, that's but, but it wasn't copied to Vintage. No. So then I had to, to, right. to, I had to cover that issue. Does it need to? And if it had just been typographical corrections, I would have said no. One final thing. Uh, explain your role. Oh, yeah. I didn't mean to address that. I, I, am, I am your advisor and your advocate. If we get sued, I would be the one to, to defend you. So it's different from being a referee. I mean, it may appear to be that way occasionally, but there have been cases where we even had outside counsel for the district because of, to remove the county council's office from appearing to represent two different sides of the three sides. So I am your advocate. It's a, it's a, there's a special uh, statutory provision for it that allows our office to do that. Robert Kwan, who is an assistant county council with an office right next to mine, is their advisor. I am not. And the, and the two, Robert Kwan and Robert Roberto Ariano, may have totally different opinions and... Oh, we then evaluate and we can uh, agree or disagree with either of them. And, and I cannot consult with Robert Kwong about a pending matter without bringing in the counsel or the principals for the, the other party. When, when we had the uh, Halico case and Dan Murphy was the hearing board advisor, we actually had phone conversations in office two doors down from mine with Halico's attorney on the line. And I did not talk to then counsel Murphy without that other counsel on the line. When in doubt, send it to me, and if it's, it's free to go just to the district, I'll say so.